the LCCMR has roughly $34 million for FY14 projects, but the amount of, of requests that came in is twice that. So how do you prioritize projects? Well, you know, whether it's at the LCCMI or, or at the IRRB that I sit on, you always get a huge amount of requests and you don't have that much money to work with. So I think, at least as a legislator, I look at, to be quite honest, you know, is it going to help my part of the state? Is it going to help, you know, the people I represent and the industries I represent? And, and I go from there. But you get lobbied a lot, too, from uh, friend, friends of yours in the lobbying industry. and. Uh, you try to do what's best for the state. You know, the LCMR uh, was supposed to do good things for the environment, but it's also supposed to enhance and protect our natural resources. So, I mean, you, you look at those things and decide how you're going to fund it. You know, it used to just be called the Legislative Commission on Minnesota Resources, and then the citizens became more involved. Now it's called the Legislative Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resources. Do you, what, what do citizens bring to the group? I never was in favor of it, and quite frankly, nor the uh, citizens sitting on the Lassard Sams Council. I think, you know, technically it gets back to the legislature. The legislature can change the recommendations from the LCCMR, and they can change the recommendations from the legacy money. And, and they substantially did that with the LCCMR recommendations last year. Yes, I and uh, I tried to do that whether I was in the minority or majority, as I sat on the, uh, I still call it the LCMR. I just had to make the point that, you know, the Constitution says the legislature raises funds and, you know, expends them or uh, appropriates them, and then the governor can say yes or no to it. And so when we got these citizens involved, I always thought, you know, granted we, we would like their input, but we're the ones that have the election certificate that in the end have to answer to the people on how we spent money. So the process you're going through right now, th this week, is it useful? Well, it's, it's useful in that all of the particulars of that project that's being funded have been, you know, they've been looked at, they've been vetted, whether by the citizens or the legislators that sit on there. And in that sense, it's useful, but in the end, it is ultimately the legislators that get elected in the Senate and the House that determine as that, as that moves forward into the, in both houses, into the Natural Resource and Environment Fiscal Committees that they can say, ah, you guys gave too much money to this project, or we don't like this project at all. You know, as your role as a legislator, as you know, you're often approached to solve problems now. You're always dealing with immediate problems. Doesn't this afford you the opportunity to sit back and look long term? Well, and, and that's the argument, but you know, one person's pork is another person's bacon, so to speak, and you can see on there which people like projects, and if their projects don't make that priority list, they're trying to, you know, get other people on the commission to get those projects back on board. So, you know, there isn't always, you know, perfectness, and it's not everything's perfect in funding. One of the top projects this year was for the Aquatic Invasive Species Center at the University of Minnesota, and, and, and when that was being discussed by the commission, you raised a very excellent point. You said, now, I used to chair the higher ed committee, and we would review these projects. Right. Do you fear that we're moving, the state's moving more towards dedicated funding away from general funding? They are. And, you know, I opposed the two recent constitutional amendments, the one that uh, dedicated the sales tax on cars and trucks to the, uh, to the highway funding, and the, uh, the legacy money because once you start dedicating funds you have no leeway i mean we're buying property we're the minnesota is the third largest landowner in the united states of america behind alaska and the federal government we're buying all kinds of land whether at the lcmr or at the lassard sams and meanwhile we're cutting schools we're cutting uh uh the university of minnesota and the minsky system we're not funding our nursing homes properly and it's a dangerous situation. Are you saying our priority, priorities are wrong? Well, I, I think so. You know, if we're going to dedicate everything, what's the, what's the use of having a legislature? You know? Should there be the expectation that when... But if I can get back to the point I made in the meeting this morning. Sure. I mean, when I got elected in 1986 and came here in 87, 15% of the general fund budget went to higher education. Now it's down to 7.5% last year. I think almost 7%. That's a 50% cut. And, you know, student debt now in this country is at $1 trillion, more than credit card debt 
and car loan debt. We're going down a precarious uh, road here, and once you pass uh, constitutional amendments that dedicate money to clean water and the outdoors and the arts, or you know, take the sales tax on cars and trucks and you put it into uh, the Department of Transportation, you're not giving the legislature the leeway they need. Well, you parlay me into the next section of questions I would like to ask, and that's, you, you shocked all of us when you made the decision that you're not going to seek public office again. And you didn't have a speech on the House floor announcing that. Why did you reserve making that announcement, and what forced you to make that decision? Well, I've been here 26 years, and believe me, I have had a great time. I said I should have paid for this job, you know, because I've had a blast. But we, you know, it's serious business what we do here. And after a while, it just weighs on you. I'm 62 years old, and I've been here 26 years. I mean, you, you do not look 62 uh, years I old. I feel it, believe me. And, and you know, it, it starts to weigh on you. It, it's hard on your family. It's hard on your friends. And uh, eventually, you have to make a decision. And for me, uh, you know, I was moving towards that decision. I, I got my first grandchild, you know, my little granddaughter, and I took care of her before I came to session because I didn't want her to go to daycare before she was a year old. And so I was there four days a week, and, and I'll tell you, I'm smitten, you know, and I thought I'm going to spend more time with her, and uh, I'm also going to get married uh, in October, and uh, I wanted to spend some more time with my, my new spouse. So. You know, it was the right time to move on. Ironically, when I ran in 1982 and I lost by 16 votes, I had been redistricted from Joe Begich's district, my township, which was Senate District 6 then, into Senate District 5, my hometown area of Virginia and that where I grew up. And now, with redistricting, we become Senate District 6 again. I thought that was kind of like a sign from God. <laughs> it's time to move on. So what advice do you have for those who are going to remain? Well, we have starved government to the point that we can't starve it anymore. And it, it saddens me that we have had, in the last decade, I think seven or eight deficits out of the last 10 years. Something's out of kilter in this state, and I think we have to come together. Governor Dayton is right. You know, the wealthy people got the breaks at the turn of the century, and now that we're, you know, we need money, we need funding, I think it's the wealthy that should help pay again. Uh, and in a good example, uh, well, Governor Dayton's proposal to tax the wealthiest Minnesotans would have affected 68 people in St. Louis County, but instead, about 100,000 taxpayers, property taxpayers, got an increase instead of 68 people getting an increase on a fair tax, which is the income tax. We have to come together and admit that we need more money in this state. And, and fun things again like taking care of our children, taking care of our seniors in the twilight of the years and, and stop this craziness that's going on in college funding where, like I said, a trillion dollars now collectively and, and nationally uh, in student loan debt, that's not right. When you look back at your career, what will you be most proud of? Well, a couple of things. And I have to give credit to where credit is due here. You know, Arnie Carlson signed a law that I passed uh, uh, on the House floor and the Senate passed it, uh, saying that a mine was a, an important thing to this state and those resources belong mostly to the state and the University of Minnesota. And when a mine closes, we're gonna have a, a moratorium of a couple years where that bankruptcy court has to keep that mine in operating condition to give the state time to find somebody else to operate it. And because of that, United Taconite and Eblith reopened under a new owner. National Steel, Kiwantan Taconite plant reopened twice now. And the infrastructure at, uh, at uh, LTV in Hoyt Lakes was saved so that our first copper nickel mine might be able to use that infrastructure there. That was for my constituents, and I think for the state, a very important law. But uh, another one that I'm really proud of is I took the mineral rights that the University of Minnesota owns and I put it into a scholarship that they rightly named an Iron Range Scholarship. And it one out of every five incoming Minnesota freshmen from all over the state at every campus of the university gets a thousand to two thousand dollars a year in a scholarship fund. It's the biggest scholarship at the U and I wanted people to have the same opportunity to go to college as I had. It was a lot cheaper when you and I went to college than it is today. So and any help we could give 
you know, is important. And I think that that fund, and it's growing, by the way, exponentially because just ironically, Kiwant and Taconite, which was closed twice and then reopened with that other law, is now paying the university about $11 million a year in mineral royalties. So the fund's growing fast. Uh, one very brief question. Uh, when the legislature comes back for a special session, will you give a final speech on the House floor? You are one of the most entertaining legislators that this building has ever witnessed. Well, I was afraid of what I might say that night because, you know, my mother told me to keep my mouth shut if I couldn't say anything good. And I could have said a lot of good, but I could have raised a lot of heck that last night. And I just kind of figured I'd walk away into the sunset. So I don't know if I'll say anything at all. You know, if if and when we do come back in a special session, I think I've made my announcement, and I, and the press has been very kind to me and people all over the state. I got letters from people I have no idea who they are, even thanking me for some of the things I did. So, I think that was enough for me. I don't have to give another speech. Well, we certainly wish you the best, and thank you so much for thank coming on the Thank you so much for everything you guys do. The staff around this place is wonderful, and you're part of it. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.